All right, here we are. So welcome everyone. I am here today with two guests and it is such an honor and a privilege to be speaking with both of them. There is A.P. Canavan, whom some of you will recognize from my discussions with him about the, the books in the Malazan world, the Malazan Book of the Fallen. We are doing a 10 part series, one book a month, uh, and we've already done our Gardens of the Moon discussion, both a spoiler free and a, and a spoiler one. And we'll be doing all the other books, that, uh, the, the uh, 10 books in the series uh, over the next nine months. So welcome back, AP. It's great to see you. Great to be here. Thanks for having me back. And joining us is none other than the author of The Malazan Book of the Fallen, Stephen Erickson, also author of many other books, uh, both in the Malazan world and outside. And it's just, uh, as I said, it's such an honor and I'm so delighted to have you here. Thank you for, for being here. Oh, I'm, I'm looking forward to this. This should be a lot of fun. Great, great. So I thought we could start perhaps with a thought or two about the Renaissance, this flowering of uh, channels devoted to the Malazan Book of the Fallen and the Malazan world in general on YouTube. And it's been really a, a pleasure for me to, to watch all these new channels coming. And it's just, uh, there's a lot of great thought going on about these books, which seem to support a lot of nice critical analysis. It's just wonderful to see. And there's also just this wonderful sense of, of camaraderie and bonding over these books uh, in the communities that are being created. Uh, I will put links in the description below to the, all the channels that I know of so that anybody who wants to can, can take a peek at some of these channels. But I'd like to single out maybe just a couple here in, in passing. One would be Iskar Jarek's channel. Mm -hmm. And he's just uh, an incredibly generous and kind person who has been encouraging the growth of all these channels. And he is just somebody who, who reaches out to help other people. And he's just wanting to see lots of great content uh, about the Malazan Book of the Fallen and, and the Malazan world. Another one I think that is, is important to mention would be Mike from Mike's Book Reviews. And this is, uh, he's, I think you're aware that he is going to be doing a read along on his channel. And this is probably, to me, the most exciting thing happening on YouTube is the read along that is happening on Mike's channel, Mike's book reviews. And Mike is just so professional about everything. He is a wonderful channel. Both of them, Iskar and Mike are just two, they, they embody what booktube is all about to me. Uh, and there's just, they're, they're very generous, kind spirits. So among, you know, all these other channels, which again, I will link in the description below, but I wonder what you think about this proliferation of, uh, of content on YouTube devoted to your books. And I've also, I've noticed that you have been more willing than most authors, particularly authors who have had as much success as you've had to engage with your readers and your fans um, at, at, um, the level of even a channel like mine, which is fairly small, on on BookTube, uh, but yeah. It, so what are your what are your? Well, I mean, initially, I, I it's kind of startling because it's it's been ten years, I think, about ten years since I finished the series. Yeah. Um, so it may partly relate to the fact that there were a few other major series out there that that weren't being finished, and and you know, ten years is a long time to to wait for another book. Um, so uh, right now, in, in a sense, I'm feeling like I can't keep up. There, there's so many that are that are uh, appearing. I'm um, very appreciative of Iska Durak's um, efforts to sort of bring people together and actually have you know um, conversations where three or four of them are are, are on on screen and um, discussing. Yeah. Things. Um, but as for my participation, well, why wouldn't I? You know, why wouldn't I? You know, uh, engage with uh, with the readers. They're, you know, they're they're, they're my audience, right? So, um, and even those who you know may not like elements of the books or or even not finish the books, at least you know they're they're participating in some fashion or another. So, why wouldn't I sort of keep an eye on just what you know what's being discussed, what's being talked about? Um, how these books are impacting uh, readers. Um, and uh, it's just, it's been really rewarding. Uh, you know, in a sense, I felt I've been waiting, waiting to actually 
um, start getting some kind of response to the series, you know, mm. especially after finishing the crippled God and, and um, having it get published and kind of almost drop into silence. You know, it's like the series was done and, and I guess part of me wanted sort of more fanfare at that point uh, in some sense, you know, because my sense of accomplishment and finishing something um, was a high I rode on for a long time. Um, but it just didn't happen. So it, was, it, it really felt like it was just, okay, well, that's done. Better get on with something else. And so I plunged immediately into Forge of Darkness. Mm. Uh, one has to keep your, you know, one's momentum going, you know, and it's, uh, the, the weird thing is you finish a book and then you wait a year before the readers can even get to it. Right. Uh, with the exception of AP, obviously. Yes. Um, <laughs> and, um, and then by the, yeah, by the time, you know, it, it's coming out to the readers, you're already, you know, getting closing in on finishing the next book. And um, so there, there's that kind of lag. And, and so that kind of enthusiasm or uh, satisfaction has waned and doubts have crept in and all the rest. So 10 years, it, it, it's, it's been a while, um, but it's been great to see for sure. And yeah. especially um, it's, it's very gratifying to see uh, women coming on and, and commenting. Um, yes. Yeah, the diversity of booktubers. Actually, we can, we're now calling them Malaz tubers because <laughs> okay. there's that many of us now. Uh, it, it's fantastic. And I also want to mention how much my viewers have been appreciating AP's insights as we've had our couple discussions out there. I've gotten all kinds of very positive feedback. So there's a hunger out there. And uh, people are, are responding very enthusiastically. So it's, it's uh, just a lot of fun to be in the, in, in, in the mix too. It's just, it's tremendous. This is what writing is all about. This is what literature is about. This discussion, this interaction for me. Well, it's, yeah, I'm, and, I'm, not and, in, I'm not entirely sure I would describe what I do as insights. <laughs> <laughs> it's well, my, I, best, my best guess at things. I've been twisting AP's arm for a long time about sort of getting on screen because, you know, I talk to him pretty much weekly and, um, and I mean, I couldn't imagine anything more entertaining than, for example, AP's plan to um, do critiques of Star Trek Discovery uh, all three seasons, which will be upcoming because that should just be a, an absolute blast. So, yeah. so you're both oh. fans of that, right? No. <laughs> Oh no. <laughs> well, Steve Steve is a trekker and like loves original Star Trek. And uh of I uh was part of that generation that watched Star Trek Next Generation. That was my Star Trek. And then hmm. Steve's son uh, is also a bit of a Trek fan as well, but he he again was he was more Deep Space Nine and, and Voyager. Just the, oh. the transition of time. Um and like like many of these things, there's there's an abiding love for the, the franchise, for the universe created, for a lot of the characters in it. And every every time it gets announced that there's a new project, much the same way like there's a new Marvel movie coming out of it, people get excited because they're fans of a lot of those things. And you know, with uh, Star Trek Discovery, the Star Trek uh, rebooted films, and then uh, Star Trek Picard. There was a lot of new Star Trek coming out that both Steve and I were initially very, very excited for. Yeah, initially. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds a little bit like what happened with some of the Star Wars fans too, with the newer movies, yeah. Okay, well, oh well. Well, um, speaking of, um, of fans and it's um, one thing I wanted to mention too early on was um, it kind of, this is by way of apology in a way, I guess, although I've never seen you, uh, Steve, I've never seen you react to this. I've always watched you sit there with sort of saint-like forbearance as, as people say Malazan um, instead of Malazan. And, 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 and that's um, something I'm sure that uh, you're used to by now. Um, mm -hmm. When I started reading the books, I was saying, um, Malazan, and uh, it's almost hard for me to say it now because I started training myself to say 
uh, or, or Malazan, now I'm saying Malazan, see how hard it is. Uh, mm -hmm. So, um, it, and it occurred to me that um, it isn't just about saying it the way the author says it. For, it actually makes sense, it's not arbitrary. Uh, so just by way of example, I live in New Jersey and I somehow managed to live here for several years without knowing what you call a person from New Jersey. I actually was in the middle of a class and the topic came up and I asked my students, uh, wait, wait, what do you call a person from New Jersey? And one of my students, a, a, a true native son uh, with a grin on his face replied, assholes. Mm. <laughs> but actually it turns out the official word is a New Jerseyan. And just as you are from Canada, so you're Canadian, right? Um, and uh, your friend Ian Esselmont lives in Alaska where people are Alaskan. AP, this does not apply to you, I guess, sorry. Uh, you're the oddball here. Uh, Irishian. Irishian is a very common way to describe people from ah. here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so anyway, it occurred to me that, so the island where it all got started is called Malaz, mm -hmm. right? And the adjective form of that would simply be Malazan, yeah. right? And this is, I don't know why it took me so long to realize this. Um, so, it's, so that's why it's not Mal Malazan, it's Malazan. Um, yeah. So it, just my little apology for that, uh, but you don't mind too much. Uh, I've heard so many pronunciations, you know, especially various other things like Tyson D and, and um, yes. Yeah. So it's yeah. just, it's okay. I mean, it, it's, you know, whatever it sinks into the reader's head is fine with me. Well, I, I, have an issue. I do have, I do have a very short anecdote about this. Okay. Go on. Well, um, Steve was doing a, a book tour for Toll the Hounds and he happened to be in a city quite close to where I was living at the time. So I popped up for it um, and was looking forward to it. Obviously, I, I'd known Steve for a while and uh, I'd, uh, he had done his reading, done a number of questions. Um, and I think I made the point that, that uh, at that actual session, I said, how do you feel about the fact that you're mispronouncing all of the names? Because that's not how I say them in my head. Uh huh. <laughs> at which point, Steve, I think, intensely regretted inviting me along to this <laughs> Q&A session that he was doing at a, at a bookshop. Oh, that's funny. And yeah. it does lead to a, a sort of semi-serious point, which is, uh, you know, I'm sure you're very familiar with Roland Barthes' assertion that the author is dead. Um, and in terms of, you know, how you interpret a work, Oscar Wilde also is famous for saying that the critic is more important than the artist. Um, so you're very much alive. Uh, and uh, I'm curious as to your thoughts as to uh, beyond just pronunciation, you hear a lot of interpretations of your work. You hear a lot of criticism of your work. How do you balance that? I'm sure at times there's gotta be a desire to just sort of correct people or you know, be on the record versus just allowing your readers to add layers of interpretation to, to your work? Well, it's, yeah, it, 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 it can be frustrating. Um, and normally, you know, the, the, the author is sort of expected to step back and just let the work um, stand on its own. And it's, it's something that we've had massive rancorous debates uh, at ICFA, um, International Conference on the Fantastic and the Arts, mm -hmm. on this very issue. And it, it actually goes to the core of that, of that uh, conference itself, where um, you have all these academics who are uh, great fans and, and lovers of fantasy. Um, or the fantastic, if you will, so horror, um, science fiction, uh, related media, um, all this kind of stuff. And then there is a kind of a token presence of writers who are invited to this thing. So, um, you know, and, and you look at guests like the occasional one will be Neil Gaiman or, or you know, Peter Straub comes all, you know, all the time. Steve Donaldson's always there. Um, and, and then 
the conference involves um, academics and grad students delivering papers, uh, 15, 20 minute papers on, uh, you know, on different artists, different, uh, different writers, different books and all the rest. And there's almost kind of a, an implicit expectation that if the writer happens to be sitting in the audience, um, mm -hmm. you stay quiet. Uh, you let this person just do what they do. Um, and I know that, you know, I've been on a couple of panels where I've just sort of, um, I guess, cut loose and, and you know, <laughs> caused, caused some, some controversy. Um, and it is, it, it's, it's, you know, I was seeing sort of firsthand that in a sense, um, academia does not want the artist, does not want the, the writer there. Um, Interesting. So that, yeah, there's there's a kind of a push pull thing going on. Um, they can be really thrilled when Neil Gaiman shows up, but at the same time, um, you know, they're 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 building entire academic careers upon you know analysis of this guy's stuff. So it's got to be pretty scary when that person's in the audience. Yeah. Hang on a sec. As an academic who attends this conference, allow me leave to rebut. Please. Go ahead. So uh, your assertion there, Mr. Erickson, was that, <laughs> oh yeah, the authors get invited down and then they're, they're told to sit there and shut up. Followed by the sentence, well, I've been on a couple of panels. Mm. I'm sorry, at what point does sitting on a panel not be the academics engaging with the author? Well, when my fellow writers are holding up their book saying, buy my book, it's in the book room. Well, so, so in other words, my, my, my tax, as you well know, because you're sitting in the freaking audience, um, <laughs> was as much towards the fellow writers as it was towards uh, the academics in the audience. And yet, I mean, one of the, obviously, uh, Steve and I have attended this conference a lot over the last 12, 13 years. Yeah. Um, I absolutely adore the conference. So and I, I think I if, if you... If you said to a scholar of Shakespeare, um, come to this conference because Shakespeare is going to be there. Every Shakespearean scholar that I know would cut off their left arm to get to that conference, to be able to engage with the author that they're writing about, that they're researching, whose works they're engaged with. Um, and so for, for someone like me, when I was doing a lot of research and, and presenting papers on fantasy, to be able to engage with the authors who attended, to be able to sit with authors and get their perspective of work, of writing, which is obviously very different to academic analysis, um, was an absolute godsend to me in doing my own research and, and my own um, academic writing, because I was getting a different perspective. I was getting a different viewpoint. And so, uh, at, for, for a couple of years, I was the division head for uh, the fantasy literature division. And, um, and it's a tradition that's been carried on now, but we actively tried to get um, fantasy authors engaged in academic sessions and on these academic discussion panels. But as Steve pointed out, there were some authors who, who were really engaged and they were great to have up there there were other authors who seemed to think that they were more at a convention rather than at a conference. Uh -huh. And so they were treating it more as, I'm here to talk about and sell my latest book, <clears throat> which then made all of the academics in the audience cringe because they really wanted people to be engaging with books that they'd read, with writers they admired, with techniques they liked, whereas uh, I think a lot of authors are very cagey about that. They're cagey about their writing processes, that they're trying to maintain a level of mystique over how they write. Um, and then you have authors like Steve, who are open and honest about, I used to, re I read that author and I love that author. Um, I love the technique of this. This is a book I'm reading at the minute. You know, Steve has always been engaged with that sort of thing. And so, um, the, the conference, I think, is a unique place and a unique opportunity for the study of science fiction, fantasy, and horror uh, in multiple media. Uh, but the chance to meet authors and discuss things with authors, even outside of the academic setting and around 
the pool bar or in the restaurant. It, it's just been an amazing experience. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to attend in 2022. Good, good. I'm also wondering, does this topic have anything, Steve, does this topic have anything to do with the character that AP inspired in the Bocalane and Corbel Brooch novella? <laughs> uh, to some extent. Um, the conference has, conference has been changing um, over, uh, over the last few years. And I know when I first arrived there, you know, APs described that story. Um, and that was uh, back then it was in Fort Lauderdale. And oh. um, as a writer of epic fantasy, I mean, epic fantasy, even in that conference was the lowest, lowest rung with the exception of Tolkien. Oh. Um, it was just, it, you know, all of us were all producing extruded Tolkien fantasy products and all that kind of stuff. And oh, so, no, no. so I, you know, I, I, I did a lot of sort of standing around there uh, wondering um, what I was doing there. Um, and I do remember um, my side of meeting AP was, uh, yeah, okay, we had that lunch and, you know, he misidentified me as Donaldson. Like, how <laughs> old am I, right? Yeah. So, but AP was a grad student at the time. And so being a grad student, most of his days were spent hungover. And I would see that, you know, he'd be standing there with a Red Bull and, and dark sunglasses on by the pool. And you can see, right, he's just completely hung over. So I made a point of actually walking over and asking him really complicated questions just to get, you know, <laughs> just to torture him over the course of those four days. <laughs> But he's grown up a bit now. So he's, um, yeah, I think the conference, it, it, it does evolve, it does change, but every now and then uh, you get that sort of pushback of uh, do the writers really need to be there? And um, oh. so it, it's an ongoing debate. It's an ongoing debate because I think that idea of the absent writer is um, is something that's still inculcated in, in uh, literary criticism. Oh yes. Yep, for sure. And so it, it pops up there. And and so we can often sort of be the the um, uh, potentially, you know, the spanner in the works, as it were, um, in terms of making our commentary. And, you know, for all that I may have uh, uh, let loose on occasion, I'm nothing compared to Donaldson. So, you know, it's like, it, it can be pretty entertaining uh, at this conference. Things can fire up really fast. Wow. Well, I can't wait to go to one. <laughs> You'll enjoy it. You'll enjoy it. I'm sure I will. No doubt. Speaking of, of influences like AP uh, and, and the character that he inspired. Um, oh, I'll get to that if you want. Yeah. Oh, sure. Why don't we talk about that first? Yeah, I'd love to hear that. Apto Canavalian. Yes. <laughs> I, I did warn him I would, I would, I would um, include him in one of the Bokaling Cobra Brochen novellas. And, um, and there's a few other, you know, invented characters that um, you know are plucked from from my own experiences and, and people I know and all the rest so I think there's a, a character based on Joe Abercrombie in there somewhere there is now yeah yeah poor Joe yeah <laughs> and I have to say I, I love the fact that I didn't even rate to be a character in like the main series it was oh no no I'll just put you in one of the novellas not even not even one of the main books a little side character well, and, and then well, the thing is, the novellas are, are the stories in which I can torture characters uh, relentlessly. <laughs> so it's a little bit different. Okay. Well, I have to read this story now. I, I do have the book, so I'm, I'm going to have to. Oh, Crackpot Trail? Yeah. 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 So, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to that one very much. Yeah, I described that as, um, oh, what was it? The Canterbury Tales meets the Donner Party, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. I won't try to guess what uh, AP's character's fate is in that, um, but I'll have a hard time reading it without picturing you, AP, as I'm, as I'm reading it. <laughs> That's even better. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> so other influences, though, I, I, and you mentioned Stephen Donaldson. I think you're on the record as, as saying he's uh, an important uh, Glenn Cook. Um, yeah. So could we talk for a little while about what you consider to be some of your most important influences? I had a wonderful time reading the, your recent, fairly recent Facebook post uh, about your mom. And mm. uh, that, was, that was moving. Thank you for that. 
And uh, I just thought that was, I didn't realize there was so much cinematic influence in there as well. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, if you want to speak about that in general. And I also wanted to ask you about uh, possible influence from Eastern religions, philosophies as well, but wherever you want to talk about first is, is great for me. Um, <clears throat> well, I guess, you know, when one talks about influences, um, it goes far beyond, you know, the fantasy genre. Um, that's the first thing I would say is um, some of my major influences or the early ones would be things like Lord of the Flies or it would be, um, which I always read as a science fiction novel anyways. So, um, and then, yeah, certainly films, um, things that sort of were evocative, um, you know, when you're at that very sort of impressionable age, um, mm -hmm. these are the things that sink in and, and they, they resonate and reverberate um, for the rest of your life, basically. And so then it becomes a, a question of uh, shifting the lens around or the prism so that, you know, when it reappears, uh, it feels new. And, and I mean, you know, we have, we have a limited resource base, you know, each of us, and um, we re rework things over and over again. Sure. Um, so, yeah, there, there, are, there are all kinds of influences. Um, all the stuff I was reading back when books were like 50 cents per copy and, and 60 cents per copy. I, I was going through my, uh, some of my original books, which I've held on to. And yeah, astonished to see books at, at 50 cents a copy. And, and, you know, they've been around for a long time. So uh, one becomes a very voracious reader, you know, at, at, with that kind of availability. Yeah. Um, but uh, I mean, Vietnam War literature uh, had a huge influence going after Cacciato, for example, um, which was a wonderful Mobius loop of a novel, um, which really inspired me to, to write my own Mobius loop of a novel and that's kind of thing. So um, things come from, yeah, from, from uh, everywhere, other genres. Um, I read a lot of Robert Ludlum. I read, you know, Tom Clancy, um, all kinds of, you know, uh, Ian Fleming, uh, all you name it. I was reading all kinds of things. So, Steve, what was yeah, that? Yeah, uh, Steve, what was that book? Was it The Short Timers? Yeah, it's one of my favorite novels ever. Yeah, and uh, you you had a point that it it was a uh, horror supernatural story. Yes, it has one scene that that slips into the surreal. Yeah, yeah, it has a vampire. I mean, can you believe it? This is a Vietnam War novel, and it's got a vampire show up. It's brilliant. It's oh, brilliant. Yeah. Very cool. Huh. Yeah. Neat. And uh, Tim O'Brien, he's one that I teach a yeah. lot. Um, yeah. Do you include him in that list? Yeah. 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 Wonderful. Yeah. And you can see you can see how that stuff had an influence on on Glenn Cook. You know, also a Vietnam War vet. Um, and that sensibility of, of of the dialogue among among. Uh, soldiers just slipped right across into fantasy uh, effortlessly, and that's what Glenn Cook showed us: is that yes. you know he can take you can take your 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 grunt um, and just lay them into a, a science or a, a fantasy setting, where instead of napalm you've got magic, and in both cases, you know what does the grunt do? Well, they 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 duck, you know they yeah. they crawl into a trench and yeah. hope they survive, and that that was really um, an eye opener. Uh, in terms of what was possible in fantasy. So um, I've always, always thank, every time I, uh, I run into Glenn, I thank him. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, that and the, the, the relationships, the humor between the soldiers, I, I see that. And also the idea of it being a history um, in both the case of the Black Company and it's the Malazan Book of the Fallen. Yeah. Um, so that's another interesting topic I'd love to talk to you about too, is, is your portrayal of history and historians. And uh, there seems to be um, a bit of doubt about the uh, reliability of history at times. Oh, sure, sure, yeah. completely, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's all about point of view, you know, and, and um, with, uh, with his historical accounts, the primary sources, the first thing you have to look at is the point of view. Who's who's writing this, um, and you know what's what culture they derive from, it and what is their purpose in writing this? Is this is this um, 
is this sort of to echo the British Empire or is this, you know, even though you're writing about Rome, you know, it, it's, it's, it's all these things that, that are in play. Um, and, and, you know, when I was going in university, social history was, was, it was just starting up. And so, you know, it was basically all the facts and, and that that's what you're going to be looking at. And I, I, re I had huge doubts regarding all those facts. So. Mm. Right. But you also have uh, within uh, history, but uh, predominantly the, the sort of the running joke I have with you about archaeology and it's anytime they find something and they don't know what it was or what it was for, it was like, oh, there must be a ritual significance to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we uh, quite often, uh, particularly with fantasy, you see this of cultures that are meant to be radically different from our own. And yet, invariably, we impose our own sort of cultural mores and biases and, and viewpoint onto that. And you can see that through sometimes when an author has written something and they're meant to be different, but we go, but that only makes sense from, say, a Western perspective. So it, it's, for me, it's one of the interesting aspects of that. Yeah, and I, I know for, uh, just to get to the sort of Eastern influences, <laughs> um, yeah, I certainly read uh, as much of the mythologies as, as I could. Um, I remember trying to get into a class to learn Sanskrit at the University of Manitoba. And the, after the first class, the instructor pulled me to one side and told me to leave and <laughs> never come back. Oh, so, no. <laughs> um, I guess I was, I don't know, the wrong culture or something. But I, I really had an interest. And I, I, was, I had an interest because I had taken linguistics as well. And, and so Sanskrit being the closest to the Indo-European sort of language base, uh, I was really fascinated. Um, so yeah, I got steered away from that, but I was I was I was more interested in the notion of, of epic fantasy as as a driving force in, in terms of cultural identity um, all through time, and yep. so um, I, I guess I defaulted to the Iliad because it was it was closer in, in, in that respect. But you know, both both those Eastern texts, the Vedic texts and stuff, and the Iliad are fundamentally very similar. Yes. The activity of the gods uh, is, is, is paramount. Um, and the presence of mortals trying to sort of survive within those wars uh, and contests among the gods. Um, and, and the way, you know, both sides, you know, both the mortal and the immortals are, are actively exploiting each other in mm -hmm. one fashion or another. Um, yeah. Seems to me there's a common wellspring there, whether it yeah. be the Indo-European one, which also you could throw in Norse mythology as well. And um, but yeah, I, I, that's that's pretty interesting to hear. And also for me, when I was reading, particularly when I reviewed uh, Forge of Darkness, mm. something that really hit me as I was reading both books of the Carcanus uh, trilogy that are out so far was your treatment of characters to me felt something um, there was something almost buddhist about it um and perspective hmm. in and in, in the sense that I, so i was reading uh a while back i mentioned this in my review of forge of darkness this book by Thich Nhat han called the heart of the buddha's teaching and the conception in there of an individual is that we are like a wave essentially on a body of water it's a beautiful metaphor and the wave might think it's an individual for a while, right? It might think that it's a happy little wave, but really it's just part of the water and it will return shortly to the water and it always has been part of the water. And I feel this in the Malazan world, what happens to a lot of the characters, there's a lot of, first of all, beautiful connection. These moments of between individuals where they connect, there's almost this blending of selves at times. And literally sometimes there are characters who are in one body, several spirits or souls, if you will. So that's kind of where I thought, wow, this is interesting. And, and is there any kind of connection there or what are your thoughts on that? Um, probably, uh, I read a lot of nonfiction. Um, and I certainly was in, even while writing, I think, Forge of Darkness and Fall of Light, 
uh, on a personal level, I was in a transition from atheist to agnostic. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I was starting to plunge into some very esoteric texts uh, and just out of interest and, and reading um, as many different takes on, on the human condition as I could possibly find. And I continue that to this day. And um, I know AP and I have, have had some discussions on that kind of stuff as well. Um, he's from, you know, strict, I, is it strict Catholic upbringing or, or traditional Catholic up, upbringing? Um, my, my family would be yeah. fairly yeah. traditionally strict Catholics. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, so we, we have discussions on, on those lines um, and all that stuff percolates through and, and shows up in the fiction in some fashion or another. Um, that's why I always view the writing of a novel as, as an active dialogue with the present, uh, you know, at that time at which the novel is being written. It is my, my dialogue, partly with myself, um, partly with the world as I perceive it at that time. And that's why it can be very difficult to make comments on things like Gardens of the Moon, you know, which is like decades and decades old, you know, yeah. because I really, I don't remember, you know, uh, the extent of how I was engaged. Uh, but in that, that kind of but Go Steve, ahead. you see, that, that'd be one of the points to, to circle back to something we said we were talking about earlier. When authors are in an audience for an academic paper and we're talking about a, a work that they wrote maybe 20 years ago, you as the author now are a completely different person to the author that you were then. So the, the author constructed in the critic's mind or even in your own mind of, of the, what you did back then, um, that, that's a fictional construct that we're working with as to what that author is, which ties in a wee bit to you know, the death of the author. You certainly have every right as the artist who created it, but you now are such a different person that you can look back on that, not know exactly what you were doing at the time or have rationalized or come up with a different reason for it. So, I mean, th there is that academic debate about um, the importance of the author's voice. Uh, I, I am firmly on the side that the author's voice has to be included as a very important voice, but I don't think that the author's vision and their opinion is the be all and end all of any discussion. Yeah, and I mean, for me, the, my argument was always that every work, every work is contextual. contextual. Um, and if you remove the, the author from your analysis of the work, you removed it. You removed its contextuality, and I know that there's a whole, you know, movement of literary criticism that is very happy to remove its contextuality. So, mm -hmm. and that's what I would. That's what I was objecting to. Yeah. Well, so we've we've talked about this before, and you know that my approach has always been more of a, you know, take the the book, read through the book, have a think about it, but then start working in on. Uh, the various critical lenses as each time taking a different view, um, extracting different information, and then putting it in the perhaps the cultural context of when it was written, yeah. uh, the, the marketing or commercial context of when it was published, and taking into account biographical information about the author if it's available. I mean, yeah. the more rounded, the more information you can get, the more insight you can get into a novel. Yeah. Agreed. It's an interesting discussion and another related discussion might be in terms of fantasy as a genre has an interesting potential, I believe. Um, it is certainly traditionally grounded in a lot of older tropes and, and that sort of thing. But you as an author can come at it and I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Steve, you came as a fantasy author with the intention of playing with tropes, with uh, upending some of them, uh, taking them in directions they had not been taken before. Yeah. And ha does that matter that this was your intention, I guess, as part of this discussion? But I feel like fantasy in particular as a genre that is fueled by the imagination, maybe more than any other. That's one of the things I love about fantasy. That's one reason why I feel it's a genre that deserves serious critical attention. I, I believe there's so much potential, particularly today as the genres become more diverse, which is a, a wonderful thing. 
And I just think that it has this capacity to challenge the status quo, ironically, because people think of fantasy as escapist. And I don't think so. What are your thoughts on that, both of you, really? Well, go ahead, Eddie. Well, I don't see what's wrong with escape uh, as in this sense. Like, I mean, look at the, the, the year that we've all just had. And how can you deny anyone a modicum of release and escape through a fictional universe, a fictional world? I think that is one aspect of all fiction, not just fantasy, but all fiction is that it is escapist. The, what I would take a, offense to, or what I would disagree with is that uh, fantasy writing is only escapist. And uh, I think that grossly uh, underestimates and underappreciates some of the great writing that you have in the genre. Um, if you wrote a novel about tensions in the Middle East, anyone reading that book is going to immediately have at least some opinion about the Middle East tensions because it's a real world thing. There are real world politics, there's news involved and your own knowledge of it. If you took that same historical event from the Middle East and you placed it in a fantasy world, but changed all of the names, changed the setting slightly and wrote a story based in that, you allow a reader to experience uh, an attention from the real world, but removed from preconceived notions or biases that we may already have. And that's one of the strengths of, of science fiction and fantasy writing is that they have the ability to take from the real world and explore it, not necessarily in a symbolic way, but in a way that uh, removes some of the the real world uh, preconceptions and uh, preconceived notions that we have uh, about certain situations. So I think that's an important aspect of fantasy. Not the only one, but it, it I think bears, uh, bears noting. And then I think the major reason I really enjoy fantasy is it takes you outside of a lot of your preconceived notions of the world entirely and mm. makes you reevaluate a different way of looking at the world where you're moved outside of a capitalist system. You're moved outside of a modern political system where you start looking at individual characters and uh, weighing up morality based on all of these sequences that fantasy uh, has an ability to take us and connect us to an imagined past to a, a time when it was more focused on individuality and what it means to be a person rather than just being a cog in an industrialized or uh, capitalist system where you wake up, you go to work, you come home, you eat your dinner, you go to bed. Fantasy was a way of looking at the world to see and play in an arena where your mind had the ability to explore other avenues that are not necessarily locked into the systems that we currently live in and work in. Yeah, to give a specific example, and then I'll let you talk, Steve, is you wrote your books and you created this world with Ian Esselman as a world that is relatively free of misogyny. That was a, a deliberate choice, I believe, if, I, mm -hmm. if I'm hearing these interviews and things right. I, I think that's a, a, a wonderful thing. And that has repercussions, I think. You know, and for example, just today, Iskar Jarek uh, released a wonderful video where he challenged us Malaz tubers to create video, videos about women in the Malazan world. And I, I believe that these kinds of things can influence the direction of the genre to a degree. I mean, we're, I think so. And I, I would say I would applaud that. Uh, but anyway, I'll let you, you answer everything that AP said too. Well, I guess uh, coming out from the writer's point of view, I've long since given up on the notion of the fantasy genre actually being, you know, treated seriously uh, within um, literary criticism. I, I, I've given up on the idea that you're, you'll ever see, you know, an in-depth analysis in Harper's Magazine or in, in the New Yorker. It's just, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, Primarily the reason being, and I know this from experience, both here in, in Canadian literature, Ken Lit as they call it, um, and at Iowa, is 
those writers who are writing a meta contemporary fiction, um, they're by and large, that's what they read and they don't read anything else. Um, when I talk to fantasy and science fiction writers and we start dropping names of books we've read, we cross genres all over the place. Um, are, we're much more widely read on average than your contemporary fiction writer. And I have, you know, I've been to far too many festivals and events in Canada when I first started out trying to be, you know, the, the serious literary Canadian writer and saw and, and discovered how quickly, you know, my conversations with fellow writers uh, within that subgenre just dried up because, you know, I was reading stuff they had no idea about. Uh -huh. um, and I would, you know, I've said before that, that fantasy is, is the hardest genre to write. There is nothing harder. Um, you know, to take AP's example of, you know, writing a novel about uh, the Mideast, Middle East. If you're writing that novel, you can rely upon a certain level of knowledge base from the readership that this is how the world works. Uh, this is how people are. Um, this is these th these are this is the physics of this particular universe. Um, we know what you know. We've heard. We've seen pictures of Beirut. We know Jerusalem. We know Tel Aviv, etc. In some fashion, we share a certain knowledge of that. In a fantasy book, you haven't got any of that. You've got to build it from scratch, um, and that's 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 hard. It's, it's hard. hard. How, do you, how do you avoid too much exposition and info dumping and that sort of thing? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, to write a novel set in the Middle East about the Middle East, uh, I, I hate to say it and sounds, you know, um, presumptuous on it, but that's a dawdle. That's easy. You know, you just do your research and, and you go write the book. Huh. Um, <laughs> but you want to bury that story in a fantasy setting where um, the physics of that universe are, are fundamentally different. Mm -hmm. um, and you want to bury that story to such an extent that your reader does not carry any uh, uh, predisposed biases uh, into that storyline. Um, so you got to bury it deep, um, especially on, on a subject as volatile as that one. And so at that point, yeah, you are adding and adding um, layers of complexity um, for the purpose of obfuscation, in, in a sense, um, away from our world, so that, so that the, the conflicts um, and the dilemmas that um, may be present, uh, uh, you know, as in terms of your analysis of the Middle East, for example, those are the things that come to the fore. And the specifics, um, which are often used as counter arguments to, to virtually, you know, any kind of conclusion you can draw about something, those specifics aren't there. They're not there for the, for the reader to instantly grab onto and say, well, you know, that's what this situation is like. Um, and that's, you know, it's always been that way or, or historically we've had this, this, and this. If, you, if the reader doesn't have that, then they're stuck with only what you put on the page. And that's kind of the purpose. Yep. But yeah, I have, I have very little faith in, in fantasy being taken seriously. Well, I have to say, I take it seriously. <laughs> and some of the things, as I mentioned, I believe that fantasy has the capacity to change our world and in, in positive ways and negative, of course. You know, But I think it's important for us to question tropes. And that's one of the reasons why I, I love your work. And I think it's important. Another thing I, I love about your books. And AP and I kind of talked about this the last time we, we, we had our discussion about Gardens of the Moon. We talked a bit about this theme of, you know, compassion and, and empathy and, and all of that. And forgiveness. Forgiveness is, is a, a tough thing to do. And this is, this is a world where we need an awful lot of it. And it seems to me, like AP was saying in our discussion earlier, you can't hate these characters. Once you learn, initially you might hate some characters, but then when you learn what's really going on or you get things from that character's perspective, there's this shift and suddenly you, you maybe you still hate what the character did, but you find it suddenly impossible to hate these characters. 
we don't get a bad guy in your books who gets you know justice at the hands of some aggressive hero that that, that doesn't happen that's not what we're getting here and i wonder is this something that you deliberately set out to do as you wrote these books or is it something you just found yourself doing as as you were writing was this a conscious decision to upend these tropes this way or did you just sort of do it um certainly to to upend the tropes um but we had already done that cam and i did that in our gaming mm -hmm. i mean you know the whole thing about role-playing games is you know you you buy these 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 books you know D, &D books and they are essentially an assembly of cliches that's what they are, right? Because that those, these are the recognizable tropes of, of fantasy. And I know AP is going to talk about his his mockery of this uh, adventure group in a few seconds. But um, <laughs> the so we were already unplugging and undermining everything that we were sort of seeing set up for us uh, initially in, in AD and D, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, and then later on. GURPS is a bit more freewheeling. So by that point, we, you know, um, we had already beaten up all the tropes that we could think of um, and left them in our wake. But um, so the gaming allowed us to sort of play that, those elements out. But in terms of how one approaches characterization and characters in your story, um, I draw and, and continue to draw a lot from the writings of John Gardner. Oh, um, yes. Yeah, uh, and his his take on, on moral fiction, um, and I've read the debate between him and and Warren Gass, and, and I, I'm on Gardner's side on this one. And basically, as the writer, you cannot go into a story hating a character. Hmm. Uh, you cannot actually have cast judgment upon that character before they even show up on the page. Um, so you end up having to love all of your characters. You have to be that fully engaged, um, even if they're doing horrendous things. Um, and I suppose uh, that gaming them in the first place helps you in that because you were the character at one time. Sure, yeah, yeah. And quite often you played characters on two sides of the conflict. Hmm. So, you know, um, with Gardens of the Moon, yeah, we had a whole campaign where, um, I, I played Krupp and Ralik Nam and um, I think one other character. And uh, then we played the, the alternative where um, it was the Malazan squad, you know, in the city. I mean, we played both sides and we played them both sort of, you know, equally balanced in a sense. And one was trying to defeat the other, outwit the other. And um, I remember the, the the final sessions where we actually had to pull all our character sheets together from both campaigns to do the FET, the, the party at the at the end. Uh -huh. And um, man, we were just jumping from character to character. So, you know, I had a character sheet for Anamanda Rake, but I had a character sheet for Krupp. And so then we had them in this conversation. And it was just, it was crazy. Absolutely crazy. And it, it comes but to we had fun. writing too. It's fantastic. Yeah. It was good fun. But on the the point about the, the sort of the stereotypes uh, and that sort of thing, I think one of the one of the criticisms I think both Steve and I have uh, of uh, some modern movies, TV shows, uh, that sort of thing uh, is quite often, and you see it in in some fiction and some fantasy fiction as well. The the bad guy, the evil guy, the evil side because the author or the writers have always taken the position of the good guys or the heroes, they haven't really considered why the villain has these motivations. Why, and they think of them as the villain instead of the antagonist to remove that sort of pejorative. And they don't include good motivations that make any sort of sense. They sort of have a, well, we want the, the villain to be the force that these guys are going to overcome. And they, they sort of work backwards from there. So when you think of um, even some of the James Bond films, the, the recent ones with like Daniel Craig, when you look at the villain's plan, you go, right, let's, let's have a look at all of the things that had to happen for this villain to, to get to this point. Are they omniscient? 
because he planned his escape with these guys and these guys to do this, to run through here just in time for the underground train to smash through the wall to separate him from a pursuer. You go, no one is that good. And if they were that good, they never would have been caught in the first place. Um, you see it in a lot of the Marvel movies. Why does this villain want to take over the world? Oh, because they want to take over the world. Yes, but why? Because. Um, and it's, they sort of, even with, with Thanos in uh, the recent Avengers movies, yeah, uh, he saw the, uh, oh, the, all these worlds are overpopulated. So um, I want to reduce all of the populations by half. And you go, well, if you have the opportunity to do that, why not just double the number of planets? Oh. You, you're essentially doing the same thing, but without killing people off. You just, just double the, the number movie. of planets. And <laughs> See, that's what he can do, yeah. <laughs> or alternatively, and this is where they made a slight mistake in the, the actual script for Avengers. They said he, he was, uh, with the snap, going to end half of all life. And you go, that makes sense in the comic book because he was worshipping death and there was there's a whole thing about uh, Thanos and death. Thanos, but yeah. if his idea is to reduce the uh, people who are overmining planets, then why did he reduce the number of rabbits by half and the number of whales by half and the number of wasps by half? Because rabbits None of that don't, makes don't write sense. stories. Rabbits don't write stories. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's we see this when more attention is given to the protagonist figures and no attention is given whatsoever or beyond a cursory level to the antagonists to give them a fully realized personality and what we see in a lot of the Malazan work is when we meet characters they are fully realized or at least they have they give us the reader the impression of a fully realized history yeah. And you can despise their actions. But when we get to know them, because we see that they're not just mustachio twirling villains, they have, there's a motivation for it. They were broken by something in an, er an earlier part of their life. They were shaped by a tragedy. They were shaped by circumstance. They, they may not have been nice people to begin with. You know, you don't have to go, oh yeah, I'd always have them home for dinner. There's a, uh, even for the inhuman characters, there's a level of humanity because they are fleshed out beyond simply a role or function within the text to act as antagonist or villain. Yeah. Yeah, just to give a specific example, we just talked Gardens of the Moon, adjunct Lauren. I mean, on the face of it, just write down some of the things she did that she participated in. These are, as you pointed out, AP, these are terrible things. These are not nice things. But my predominant feeling for this character at, by, at the end of the book was I felt just an immense sense of, of pity and, and, and tragedy. I didn't hate her. And I don't, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty tremendous, actually. It, it's, it, there's a lot of emotions that swirl in the reader when you feel like you, you've engaged with the character in that way. It feels very authentic to me. Uh, and, and that's something I really enjoyed. So, yeah, yeah. Well, oh, gentlemen, Steve. yes, AP? Uh, I was going to say, so Steve, just wanted to say, for making us feel sympathy for characters we want to hate, I'm sure I speak on behalf of a lot of people going, that's just mean. I know, but you knew <laughs> that, didn't you? <laughs> I'm very mean. <laughs> yep. Said in that very understated way. Yeah, yeah, that's very nice. So, well, anything else that you two would like to discuss while we're here? I've, I've discussed all the things that I wanted to touch on. So, is there anything that you, you want me to tell the story about the stereotypes? Go ahead. <laughs> so, this, this was a paper in, in ICFA, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, one of the very first papers I gave at an academic conference, and I was trying to make the point that role playing games. Uh, and the characters from role playing games, these stereotypes or uh, archetypes, uh, depending on how positive you want to be about them, have heavily influenced fantasy writing. And I thought the easiest way to do that is to describe these generic roles, give them names, uh, characters, 
and show how they fit into our perception of modern fantasy writing. And so I thought about, well, one of the first ones you obviously need is the wizard. And the wizard, the mage, in a lot of fantasy writing, uh, these are framed as scholars, as academics, that it's book learning, that they spend all of their time in their wizarding towers, reading these vast arcane tomes, which explains why they, they are physically weak. They're not taking a lot of exercise but it explains why their intelligence is high because they're doing all of this research. And so uh, given that the most common spell that a lot of these wizards seem to use was, was the fireball spell, mm -hmm. this character in my academic paper was called Professor Fireball uh, because that's all he was. He was an academic who cast fireball. And you know what? That would fit with a lot of quest groups and uh, it, it sort of fitted with a lot of the fantasy I'd been researching at that time. So I thought, well, who's the next character that you really need? And it's every quest group needs the beefy, burly warrior because the, the warrior is there to protect the others. The warrior is there to face down the nameless hordes and, and to physically shield them. And they're obviously going to have very strong physical characteristics like strength and dexterity and constitution. They can take a hit, but you know they don't necessarily have to be the brightest. You know, they, can, they can be a little bit dim. So, you know, their, their intelligence stat was a little lower. And uh, because of that, their, their name, this character in my presentation was called Tank, the meat shield, because that's basically all he did. And then I thought, but there's a very important character that you need to have. And of course, like we see it in The Hobbit and, and in a lot of uh, uh, Forgotten Realms and D&D based fiction, um, but the idea of the thief. Someone who, when they go on a dungeon crawl, can pick the locks on the treasure chests, who can disarm the traps, who in combat, you know, isn't immensely physically powerful, but they sneak up behind someone and then knife them in the back. So, you know, high dexterity, because of cunning, they might have quite high intelligence. And you know what? They're usually charismatic with their, their sarcastic or dry wit, and they're the comic relief for a lot of these things. So my, my thief character, was Sneaky McStab. Um, and so each of the names and these characters, and I gave this entire presentation, and it was one of the earliest papers I'd, I'd ever given, and I perhaps erred a little too much on the side of comedy because two of the academics in who were in the audience were laughing so hard at this that quite often my analysis was just being drowned out by their laughter. And I went, I might have to tone that down you know, for the, for the next paper. But I would finished giving my paper and, and Steve and I were, were outside and uh, later on that, that day and we were queuing up for it. Was, the, was it the banquet that night? It was the banquet, yeah. yeah. So, you know, we're all dressed, everyone's dressed up. You have the, uh, the ladies are in fabulous gowns. Steve was in a fabulous gown. Um, actually, you were wearing a very nice tux that year, I believe. Probably, yeah. Um, you know, so everyone's dressed up and, you know, people are standing around having glasses of wine, looking very sophisticated. It's the one time that academics, you know, brush, the, brush their hair. Um, and I faced the question of, well, what would you call the cleric? You didn't mention the healer of your group during that presentation. That's the classic character that you missed out. Yeah. Now, the thing was, the banquet was being held in a large hall but we were only using half of it. They divided it in two. And the other half was being rented by a Jehovah's Witness group for their worship. Uh, and it coincidentally was happening at roughly the same, starting at the same time as our banquet. So as we're standing outside and someone's asking me, what would you call the, the cleric, the healer character? I, off the top of my head, went spank my icon. As a mother and father, with their small children are walking past to their Jehovah's Witnesses uh, site of worship. And there's this heathen <laughs> blaspheming. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> so, oh yes. Can I be Professor Fireball? <laughs> that would be a good, a good trick on my first day of class, I think, right? <laughs> Just... <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, we we had a lot of, of fun at it. I mean, I, I do recall uh, um, 
the time sitting with with Steve and Cam and Robert Sawyer, Stephen Donaldson, like Donaldson is absolutely brilliant. I think Donaldson has two doctorates now. Mm. Um, and like he is he's written a fantastic essay, uh, much like Steve, you know, writing about the genre. And Donaldson has a fantastic essay on fantasy and, and what you do with fantasy and what can be done with it. Oh, wow. Um, so you know, sitting at a table and I'll come up with some inane comment about Professor Fireball or you know, this RPG element. And th these writers just look at me and go, uh-huh, right. And they launch into to their side of the debate <laughs> and they start talking about, you know, the, the difference between an archetype and a stereotype and then what they're doing with that character and how they subvert it. Um, so a fantastic conference. Yeah, it sounds great. It sounds like a, a, a good place to meet some some uh, interesting folks too. Yeah. So Steve, road trips. Yes, road trips. Well, I mean, <clears throat> yeah, my wife and I took AP across half of Canada. That turned out to be a very interesting road trip. You got to remember that AP is 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 from Northern Ireland. He's from Belfast. Yeah. So we were driving in the summer and we were crossing central BC. So up, up in the, between the, the coastal mountains and the Rockies. And um, I think that was our first stop after, after the ferry. Um, Cause when I drive, I just sort of go and, and I just keep going. But anyways, yeah, we pulled off to, to gas up and get some to eat and open the doors at which point AP discovered what, you know, 35 degrees Celsius is actually like. And, and <laughs> oh, it was, it was hotter than 35 degrees Celsius. That was a, this concrete, just bare bedrock mountain valley thing yeah. under a direct baking sun. <laughs> yeah, he, uh, he got weak need. Uh, we, had to, <laughs> we had to pour liquids into him uh, dramatically. Um, that was a bit of a shock for poor AP. And then we ended up in Al well, camping in Alberta, at which point the mosquitoes must have taken a pint from him, just mm -hmm. like all in the course of one evening. Um, because my back looked like a Braille novel. It really did. It really did. Never seen anything like it. And they all went to you, right? All the yeah, straight to the foreigner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But what Steve isn't pointing out here is uh, before we set off on this trip, um, Steve is meticulous about planning. He had all of this arranged. And so we'd, we'd packed up the back of the car. Everyone, had, we'd all gone to the bathroom. Everyone was ready. Steve, uh, Steve's wife was already in the car. I was in the car. And then Steve went, oh, oh, I've forgotten something and tottered off. After he had been pushing us both, both, he and, uh, both me and his wife, he had been making sure that we had all of this stuff ready. And then he'd forgotten something and went back in. Now, it was a nice car and being a Canadian car obviously had a facility that's very useful in winter, which uh -huh. is electric heated seats. <laughs> now, in the middle of summer, when the sun is beating down like it's an Arizona desert scene, heated seats are not quite as, as popular. So because now I was feeling slightly mischievous, I turned on the highest setting on the driver's seat for <laughs> the for the electric seat warmer. So Steve gets in, and of course, as soon as he sits down, gets the car running, the sun has obviously been beaming in through the window, so he's expecting his seat to be a little warm. And he starts driving along, and his wife, in my defense, his wife knew all about this. She's sitting in the back giggling. She knows. It wasn't just me. As I'm sitting there, and you just notice, like, the little rivulets of sweat starting to develop as Steve then turns on the AC higher and he goes, really, it's quite warm today. And then he looked down and saw that his electric seat was on. I honest to God thought he was going to stop the car and just throw me out there at the side of the road. <laughs> no, I, what I do is I, I hold off and I have, um, I, I plan my revenge and it takes a long time. <laughs> so the revenge was actually we were at uh, MizCon in Missoula, Montana, because um, uh, AP had come to visit to do my archives. So we went to the con from here in Victoria. And uh, 
we started driving back at the end of the con. And this was a drive that took us from Missoula all the way to Victoria in one day. Um, but we were racing to, well, racing. We were trying to get to the last ferry that was going to take us across the Vancouver Island. And I guess for the last, what, four hours, you needed to, you know, vacate your bladder. And, oh. and um, yeah, so <laughs> I wasn't going to stop the car. So. Hang on a sec. In, in my defense, a, a, it's a very important rule that when someone stops a car on a road trip, even if you do not need to go, you should go. As a public service announcement, <laughs> if there's an opportunity to go pee on a road trip, go <laughs> pee. Um, but what Steve isn't mentioning here is the plan was we were going to drive, have lunch, and then stop for the evening on the way. That was the plan. And we were only going to do another couple of hours drive after lunch just take it really easy then without any consultation or warning he went you know what i think we can make the last ferry <laughs> we're not stopping at which point because i am unused to hot sunny continental weather like that i have been a good boy and been hydrating with gatorade and water <laughs> oh no he had he had empty plastic bottles i wasn't concerned you know <laughs> And, and when we arrived, when we arrived at the ferry, you went, right, we're finally here. You can go and use the public uh, restroom as we're all queuing to get on the ferry. So I get out. They locked it. Oh. We'd, we'd gotten there. The bathrooms were right there. And I'm going, they're locked. We're the last in the queue to get on the ferry. Oh, no. <laughs> um, so I tested the limits about how long you, you can you can hold going to the toilet. Ooh, yeah. I don't know if that was karma for the car seat or not, but. I... <laughs> oh, it was, it was, yeah. Well, was it karma for the car seat or was it karma for that long drive across Canada for the half an hour following me drinking a Red Bull? That's the worst thing, AP with a Red Bull. Oh, my God, I mean, <laughs> it just never stopped. It never <laughs> stopped. The conversations never stop. yes. But <laughs> The, the weird we thing actually had it, to forbid Red Bull in the car. <laughs> which, <laughs> led, yeah. which led to a very interesting thing, which was anytime we stopped at a gas station, I had to find alternative energy drinks. Because, oh, that's true. Yeah. <clears throat> because I wanted to sample the delights of Canada, and one of them was called Beaver Buzz. Oh. Huh. <laughs> so, Sounds like so a local Steve, brew. Um, uh, but eventually, Steve and Claire did ban me from having any sort of energy drink in the car because, as they described it, going along normally, I'd have one of these drinks, and then what followed was about 45 minutes of me talking almost nonstop and then suddenly passing out. <laughs> yeah. You guys, my jaw is hurting from laughing right now. <laughs> well, I mean, and, and one of the things who I wanted to, to show AP was um, Southwest Saskatchewan and the Frenchman River Valley, which is the unbroken prairie um, that was an inspiration for a lot of scenes that, that I've written. Um, oh, nice. And it is, it is an absolutely gorgeous part of the world. Uh, most people, you know, even on the Trans Canada, you don't see it because you're, you're, you're a bit too far north. So you just drive right past and right through Saskatchewan. Yeah. Uh, yeah unaware of just how gorgeous that area is so um yeah we got there and and ap got to see classic uh prairie thunderstorms um and we got out to you know onto the prairie with you know uh teepee rings this kind of stuff um archaeological sites everywhere and um that was it was a it was an amazing trip it so. sounds wonderful yeah i mentioned before we started recording uh to steve and before AP got here, uh, that I had driven from Vermont to Washington State, but I didn't drive across the states. I drove across the Trans-Canadian Highway. Um, and I do remember the middle part being just these endless rolling kind of hills and really a beautiful, dramatic landscape. So cool to know that some of the stuff you wrote was inspired by that. Oh, absolutely. But well, one of the strangest things about that to me was uh, in reading uh, the molasses when they talk about the the plains or or the steps or any of these sorts of things in my imagination i always imagined it being so flat 
and I couldn't imagine anyone being able to hide anywhere oh. on on planes or step or, or anything like that. And when we were out there and I was looking at it going, things just disappeared. That yeah. it, it was deceptively flat when you were looking across it, but there were hidden valleys. There was, uh, you showed me, was it a bison fall? A uh, bison jump, yeah. Um, and then looking at these uh, little, where the, the river had dug out and suddenly there was a whole valley thing opened up. It really was a, a type of landscape that I was unfamiliar with coming from, from Ireland. Um, so that was a real eye-opening aspect of it. And it made me rethink some of the scenes uh, in the Malazan world, but also in, in fantasy in general. Yeah, and, and, the, and you know, the, the prehistoric sites that, you know, you can just pull the car over and, and walk onto the community pasture and, and 10 minutes later, you found a site. So, you know, when I, when, when I write about stone circles or stone um, lines and, and, and things used for hunting and that kind of stuff, it, it, it's that's where it's coming from it's 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 stuff you can find out there very easily yeah. and then obviously when you were over here in ireland we uh, went and had a look at those uh, fossils down by uh, mm -hmm. in county sligo yeah and you just look at this vast sort of sheet of rock that is just riddled with what were they um then we look it up it was some sort of <sighs> yeah they weren't as old as i thought they'd be they were like six million years or something like that yeah. Wow. It's pretty old. Well, I mean, in terms of fossils, you, you see stuff that's in the water, you're thinking, you know, Devonian or, or, you know, really early Cretaceous stuff or whatever. Huh. So, yeah. Wow. And of course, Ireland has its own beautiful, not a big place, but it has its own beautiful landscapes. That's for sure. Profoundly depopulated to this day. Yeah. Which, which, yeah, which really sort of is a reminder of what, you know, in terms of history, um, things that, that can have happened, you know, 200 years ago have a lasting effect on the landscape. And um, yeah. that, was, that was the thing that uh, I, I really noticed about Ireland was that, yeah. um, you know, that exodus really uh, had a powerful uh, changing um, effect. And I guess we're seeing it now more in mainland Europe as well as, as farmland mm -hmm. is abandoned and rewilding is starting to take place everywhere. Interesting. Um, wow. Yeah. yeah. Isn't Ireland one of the only countries where there are fewer people today than there were in the early 19th century or something like that? Is that, is that a fact? It, it has a certain element of truthiness to it. Um, okay. <laughs> whether or not it's a fact, uh, I'm, uh, I'm not a, an Irish historian. I do know that one of the, the popular facts was there are more Irish people living in North America yes. than, than live in Ireland. Yep. Uh, yep. The, the whole of Northern Ireland and the Republic put together. Oh, I think there are tens of millions of, uh, I know, Americans who have Irish ancestry of some type or other. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. But, well, anything else? Are there any more stories we should get uh, before we conclude, I'm sure there are some good ones uh, that we haven't gotten to yet, but uh, I don't want to overdo it. So either of you have anything else to say uh, for today's discussion? I think I'm all right. Um, AP? No, no. Um, I, I think you've embarrassed me enough, Steve. You sure. <laughs> sure. Okay, well, well I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, so thank you so much. And thank you again, both of you. Uh, for being here with me and having this, I enjoy. I don't, I don't can't recall having such a wonderful conversation. So, uh, it was, this has been a lot of fun for me. And Steve, I hope you'll join us again at some point. We are sure. going to be doing your ten books, and uh, then maybe a, a wrap up where we just sort of reflect back and and maybe if if you're available, we would love to have you join us for that discussion as well. Uh, we'll see. That's left about nine, nine, ten months away. So, uh, but uh, but I, I would add the the coda that you're only allowed to join in the discussion if you agree with everything that I've said about the books. I, I mean, that's only fair. Yeah, <laughs> sure thing, AP. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you both so much. I, I from the bottom of my heart, I appreciate this very much. It was no wonderful. Thanks, Phil. Happy yeah. New Year to you both. And to you.